Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Welcome to Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage. Today's guest is Country Music Hall of Fame award winning, Grammy winning, country icon Marty Stewart. Marty talks about how he got started all the way through his career, Johnny Cash, the, the fabulous Superlatives Band. It's really a great interview. I hope you enjoy it. If you do, be sure to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Once again, Marty Stewart. Welcome to Musicians Hall of Fame. With today's guest is Marty Stewart. Marty, thank you so much for coming in. My pleasure, Joe Chambers. I love it. This is my first time in the building. Really? And, you know, I go back to Murfreesboro, Tennessee days with you when you had a music store up there. And a Musicians tomorrow? Hall of Fame was just like uh, a nugget of a dream that you talked about years ago. And I walked in, I went, Joe did it. I know you had a lot of help, but... This is awesome. Congratulations. Oh, thanks, man. And thanks for doing it for all the musicians. That's the main thing. Well, it was it was the labor of love. You know, we wanted to do it. It's a life sentence, isn't it? Yeah. yeah that's <laughs> the truth, man. I had, I had no idea what I was stepping into, but um, uh, like I told somebody, if I had to do it over again, I'd do it over again. I know. You know so. it gives, it's great to have a mission in life. Well, but, I thought I was done. And Well, <laughs> you know, mission is... My buddy Tom Allen, great illustrator, who did a lot of album covers in the 50s and 60s. But he said something that changed my life one day. He said, it's important to keep a project out in front of you that knows more about you than you know about it. And I'm sure that some mornings you think you know this place, but oh, yeah. open the door and here's a whole other deal, right? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, a lot of people think that I, that I know everything about every musician. And I've met so many people that know so much more than I do. You know, um, I learn something every day, seriously. As it should be. Yeah. But um, you said Murfreesboro. Didn't we? Was, I had the first store I had was in Smyrna. Was it did, Smyrna? Yeah. Did you not used to live in My Smyrna? mom and dad moved up here in, to Nashville in 1974 after I got a job with Lester Flat, And they moved to Smyrna. And my mom still lives in the same house in Smyrna. So it, it could have very well been Smyrna. Well, uh, yeah, I was in Smyrna, then we went to Murfreesboro, and then we went here and everywhere. But um, I was trying to think. We were just talking about when did we first meet, and do you have? A, do you know when we first met? Do you Not know? truthfully. Do you have it? Uh. -uh. I was thinking it was Columbia. <laughs> I thought it was CBS. It could have been. Um, because I you might. When did you leave Johnny? Nineteen eighty. Six. Okay, then we met at Columbia Studios yeah, okay. then, for real. Because um, I was working with Billy Sherrill there, and, right. and I remember, I, you know, specifically remember you being there uh, with Johnny, but mm -hmm. I didn't know if you were still with him or just guesting on a recording session or something mm -hmm. like that. But I loved going to the art department at Columbia, mm -hmm. Virginia team and Bill mm -hmm. Johnson. Yes. And I love, and, and working with him kind of gave me a license to hit the back door and walk through the building get to know people and what they did and how the how the record in, uh, company functioned or dysfunctioned or whatever and you know from radio to publicity to you know whoever was sitting in the top chair down it was a great experience and having him kind of as as you know the guy out front and but what immediately started happening when i went to work with him i started taking pictures and they started getting used on his album covers and so that gave me an even better insight into how it all worked. But I loved, it was my first peek into the inner workings of a major record label. Yeah, it was to me, CBS at that time was like, it was like going to heaven to me. Because it was like, you walked in the front door, you could get a deal and walk out the back door with a completed, I mean, the art department, everything was in the same building. Right. You know. Let me throw a name at you. Do you remember Ed Grizzard? Sure. All right, ladies and gentlemen, history lesson. Ed Grizzard was the custodian right. at Columbia who would come in late in, in the afternoon. Right. But Ed, in reality, ran Columbia Records, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And what you might know Ed from is that Johnny Cash had a record called Orange Blossom Special. 
And you remember the dialogue in the middle, and, John, and this guy says, say, man, when are you going to New York? And John says, I don't know. I don't reckon I'll ever go to New York. And he says, well, ain't you worried about getting your nourishment in New York? And John says, well, I don't care if I do, I do. That was it. No kidding. They I pulled him that. in to do it. So we were doing a Billy Sherrill session. All right. Years later. That was about 1964, but in the early 80s, we were doing a Billy Sherrill session in Columbia Studio A. Mm -hmm. Ed comes walking in that afternoon. He says, what time are y'all finishing up tonight? I said, I don't know, 10 o'clock, something. He says, I'm going to bring Brother Ray by. Everybody's going, sure, Ed, and we'll bring the president by. Ed said, I'm going to bring Brother Ray by. And, man, about 8 o'clock that night, the door popped open, and custodian Ed Grizzard walked in with Ray Charles and his entourage, and I took a bunch of pictures that have since been used a lot, but it brought Ray Charles in the building that night. And the session just kind of, you know, melted, and it became about, you know, just turn the mics on and let's see what happens. No kidding. But that was it. I never knew that, mm -hmm. man. I knew that Ray did a set, did an album at Columbia. Uh, I think he had a song, a single, Love in Three Quarter Time or something like that. Mm -hmm. But then Billy did a... Um, a, a recording with him and um, friends, Ray and friends, mm -hmm. and it had seven Spanish angels and all right. that. That was like '83 or something mm -hmm. like that. But that was after he had left Columbia. Well, this was just one of those. The door opened and look at there, and it was kind of magic for a couple hours, and it was over. Yeah, and Ray was cool as hell, wasn't he? Oh uh, man, he was brother Ray. Yeah, I couldn't believe. It. I got to hang out with him too. You know, with it when Billy was producing the uh, the Ray and Friends album. It I, think was, it's it was the, great. I think it's the Denver airport they have, you know, a moving sidewalk because yeah. that airport's so big. And one day I was sitting waiting on a plane, and I thought, look at there. And it was Ray with his overcoat draped over his shoulders, just looking cool. And I watched him from the minute I saw him till he came by and disappeared out of sight. I went, that was a vision. <laughs> that was awesome. You needed your camera there. Needed my camera. Yeah. Well, while we're on the camera, how, how's the book going? I mean, you've, it's got to be incredibly successful, isn't it? Well, I keep putting out picture books for coffee tables that have cool essays and stories so I don't have to really stop and write a real book. Mm -hmm. But I love photography books. I love photography. I call my, my mother was my, is still my favorite photographer. And there was always cameras around our house. Mama was one of those kind of people. Hilda Stewart, that could be frying chicken and see the kids doing something. It didn't matter what kind of camera, she'd go, and it was a instant classic, from the heart, mama shot. Mm -hmm. And they were always kind of informal, but at the same time, the subject matter made them, uh, you know, actually formal. Mm -hmm. And I loved her, her photography. So when I came on the road, um, I brought the love of photography and the awareness of photography with me, but the first time I played in New York City in 1974, went to a, a bookstore in the village, and there were some beautiful black and white jazz portraits taken by a bass player named Milt Hinton. And I, took, I got the feeling instantly that Milt had his bass in this hand and the camera in this hand, mm -hmm. and he had total unparalleled access to the family of jazz. There was the one I remember was Ella Fitzgerald shooting dice with the boys. Mm. But then there was scenes on the bus, scenes in the studio, scenes backstage, scenes on stage. And I thought, I can do this with country music now. And I called, went outside of the bookstore and called my mom down in Mississippi and said, would you send me a camera? She sent me a Kodak Instamatic. And I proceeded to terrorize anybody that was stand still. But that's where it all started. And I'm not a great photographer. I think I have a pretty good eye. But the situations that I've had access to and the people I've had access to, that's what defines the photography sometimes to me. Yeah, well, you definitely had those situations, and I think you're a great photographer myself. But. Take right right now if I had my camera. <laughs> it would break. <laughs> it, would be, it would be the ultimate Joe Chambers portrait. <laughs> so, COVID era portrait. Yes. Uh, this is so weird, isn't it? Uh, be sitting like you know for here. once musicians i think musicians and people that run restaurants and bars but musicians we drew the winning card this time didn't we it's like we can't we're out of work uh, yeah and i went out to the bus lot to get some things off the tour bus i guess about last may early may 
and the entire bus lot was filled. And I said, it's probably this way at every bus lot mm -hmm. in town. I thought, man, the circus has stopped mm -hmm. till further notice, and there's no wiggle room here. Mm -hmm. But I'm praying for the lights to come back on. I'm looking for that back door. I'm I'm waiting for that vaccine. I'm, I mean, you know, I can't. I'm, as soon as I get a call, I can get one. I'm I'm there. You know? Oh, I'd bend over on NBC if it helped. Yeah, <laughs> you know? right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but it is anything to fill some put some and I do have a feeling that when we do finally get to do You know the ultimate rule of playing a honky-tonk The first thing you look for is the back door So I'm looking for the back door of this thing But I believe when we do finally get around to getting to that through the back door that people have been pent up mm -hmm. For so long and I know every band in this town and every other town ought to be fresh Ready to go. I hope they've written a bunch of good songs and rethought things but the audience should be ready to hear some music. I think that from the stage and from the audience that everybody's going to be more appreciative than than they were yeah. of everything, you know, because I can't imagine what it's going to be like to go to the first real concert at, at the Bridgestone again, you know, or or the little any little club around town for that fact, you know, just but every, I think I feel the same way everybody's Ready to biting at the bit, ready to go. I didn't really miss it because I've, I've enjoyed the rest, to be honest. Because we were talking, huh? Th this is the first real year I've had off since I was 12 years old. But I didn't really miss it. But last summer, somewhere along the way, I got in the car and the Grand Ole Opry was having a replay. And Mike Snyder was on there and doing one of his routines and playing great music. And he had the audience in stitches and in pieces. I mean, he was slaying it. And I heard the applause and the laughter, and it made me cry. Mm -hmm. So I thought, it's such a part of me, you know. Mm -hmm. I loved it. And it really made me miss it. Do you remember the last gig you played? Superlatives and I were in Virginia, I think. And, you know, at that, this is back in March, and it's like it just started falling. It's like watching sand go through your hands, right. you know. And we were, we were booked all the way through 2020. And the first quarter was mostly out on the West Coast. Everything except for three venues were sold out. Things were clicking, uh, you know. We were, were just having a moment, coming up on a moment that we'd been working so hard to get to. And it was like watching the ship go by. Yeah, same yeah. thing here. Yeah. yeah. We, we were expecting to have the best year we'd ever had. You know, we were like so looking forward to April and May. And like you said, it was just, that was a great way of putting it. The sand just kind of slipped through your fingers mm -hmm. there. But so uh, superlatives. I love that band, man, and I, I, I loved it from every. Just uh, you know, a lot of times we have member changes, you know, you know, but it's worked out really well. It seems. With I love the band you got right now, you know, and the superlatives. Um, we started in a. Um, I, I I'd, I'd done this. I'd toured for from 72 to like 99 and did a record called The Pilgrim and it bombed commercially but it was the most right thing I'd ever done but it was also it was time I got dropped from the label lost my publishing deal lost my manager it was just it was like start over and so I let I let the swelling go down for a few months mm -hmm. And then I saw Kenny Vaughn on TV one night playing with Lucinda Williams, and I don't know who that guy is, but he reminds me of Luther Perkins that played mm -hmm. with Johnny Cash, and he's an odd duck, and I love him. And I forgot to watch Lucinda, sorry, Lucinda, but and watch Kenny the whole time. Ran into him a few weeks later. What are you doing? Nothing. I said, let's, let's talk about it. So we got together, and I'd been playing a little bit at the Grand Ole Opry with, with Harry Stenson and Richard Bennett. We were just going out having fun on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And Harry and I had worked together a lot on a lot of records. And so when Kenny and I broke camp that day, it was, I said, I'll find us a drummer, you find us a bass player. And so I, and I talked to Harry, and Harry was, eh, maybe, but I said, oh, come on, let's play. And uh, Kenny found a bass player named Brian Nolf, Brian Glenn. And from the first rehearsal at this little church rehearsal studio in Charlotte, I knew that there was something different about the band it wasn't about chasing three-minute hits up and down Music Row anymore. It was way beyond that. Mm -hmm. And it didn't take me long to understand that we were cultural mercenaries or missionaries or whatever. And we kind of had a, a summit, and the, 
the result was if we believe in it, we'll pay to get there. Mm -hmm. If we don't believe in it, you ain't got enough money to get us. And we treat the outhouse and the White House the same, and from the small town newspaper and New York Times all the same. Thousand watt radio station, fifty watt, thousand watt radio station, or beyond. It's all the same. It's like we have something to do. And I thought, well, we took one more run at commercial radio, and it was like nothing. And I thought, all right, we'll take our case to the people. So we went into the back ro roads of America to develop the band, develop the sound. And I said, when we play ourselves out back to the lights, we'll have stories to tell, and we'll represent people that need talked about. And it just happened to be that they were some of the greatest musicians in the world and the most versatile people, statesmen-like characters. All of us have been there and done that. So Brian lasted a while, then Apostle Paul Martin came in, and he, uh, we knew the day we hired him that he wouldn't last too long because he had a house full of kids. And in the kids' rooms when they were little, they had bunk beds out of Hemp Hill bus <laughs> <laughs> and a Marshall amp by the bed, and they were incredible. So Paul lasted a long time, and now Chris Scruggs, and so still Kenny and Harry and Chris Scruggs, and it's it's been an incredible band to be a part of. I'm so proud of them. Hey, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Hey, Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum Backstage fans, check out our new backstage gear. From t-shirts to coffee mugs, we've got you covered. Not yet a fan? Check out our YouTube channel and enjoy some intimate conversations with the world's best musicians. Welcome back to Musicians Hall of Fame backstage with Marty Stewart. So uh, I'd like to talk some more about the super superlatives. Um, like I said, I love that band. I love the, the, the new membership in it as well. And I remember Chris coming by my guitar shop and just hanging out. And I thought he was a really cool kid, you know, and I was just so happy when I saw that he was in your band. And uh, so how did that happen? We had done 156 episodes of a television show that celebrated traditional country music. And every time we needed just that, that guy that could kind of come in and do anything from playing non-pedal steel to sock rhythm to adding, you know, flair to the set, Scruggs came around. And um, I would call Chris and if he was available, he'd come play with us. And it always just fit. And so when we, we understood that Paul Martin was going to leave and, and uh, go work with his family, Kenny and Harry and I got together and I said, Who, where do you find another superlative? Mm -hmm. You can't exactly walk out and find just anybody that knows the language of what we do and, and all the ins and outs of it, the nuances of that. And Chris's name came up and said, well, call Chris. Kenny, was, his assignment was call Chris and see if he knows anybody. And Chris said, how about me? And, and he called me back and told me, I went, you got to be kidding. And so it worked perfectly because, you know, I'd known Chris since he was a kid. Mm -hmm. And he just felt like family, mm -hmm. you know, the whole Flatt and Scruggs empire. You know, once, once you within 10 miles of being a Foggy Mountain people, you're always a Foggy Mountain people. Mm -hmm. And he has that same sparkle. Uh, you know, any Foggy Mountain boy, that ever, if you ever met any, that walked into a room, the sun came out. There was just something about those guys. And Scru Chris Scruggs has that same thing. He walks in a room and the room lights up. He's one of those characters. Yeah, he just he just fits perfectly yeah. on stage, and I love his I love his bass playing too. You know? Oh, that that was the most surprising thing. Is the first because I really love upright bass on some things, you know, and I knew that he was one of those kind of guys that could tell you what color shirt Jerry Bird was wearing when he played on that session, you know, mm -hmm. or, or what Johnny Seibert did when he was playing with Carl Smith. He, he, he is just brilliant mm -hmm. source of information when he comes to that. He is full of that sort of knowledge, but I had no idea when he played upright bass that he was such an artist, you know, his, his left and right hand are just impeccable, mm -hmm. his slappage, <laughs> and he can walk through, you know, and, and show you how Fred Maddox played it or how Bob Moore would have played it mm -hmm. or how Junior Husky would have played it mm -hmm. and on and on and on. He's just, he's one of those encyclopedic kind of characters, you know. Uh, on the other end, six string, Ken, Kenny, uh, I, he's got to be one of my favorite guitar players, period, you know. I mean, and, and like you say, he's got that image too. He's, it's kind of quirky, you know, in a way looking, but he, you know, but it's, 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 it's perfect, you know. The, 
what all three guys share and what any superlative has always said is it, we are all as a as a group collectively and individually students of of so many various forms of music mm -hmm. we are students and on the other side of that i see all those guys as professors because i can sit in whole court with anybody whether it's a, a young musician getting started or an old timer that we love and you know and honor but all of those guys it's 24 hours a day and on the bus is music mm -hmm. music 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 and that's the way i like it i don't care about <laughs> politics i don't care about all of those kind of things that tend to, you know, fame and fortune that get inside of bands and get inside of heads, you know, that's not what the superlatives was ever about. It's about champion something. And one day after we started, I, I, I remember thinking we have been honored guests everywhere we've gone. We did a record called Soul's Chapel about the, dis you know, kind of honoring the disappearing sound of Mississippi Delta gospel, staple singers kind of mm -hmm. sound. And there was a Live at the Ryman Bluegrass record. Uh, we did a record called Badlands that shined the light on the Lakota people in South Dakota mm -hmm. that are a big part of my life. But one day I went, I, we're honored guests, but I don't feel like we have any place to drive our sword and go, this is our territory, mm -hmm. this is our flag. And one day, traditional country music came forward. I went, ah, that's what I love the most. It makes me, it makes my heart fill up. It's a disappearing culture that is so poor, important, and we have about five minutes left to get the great ones, as well as the young people coming on that still love it. And that's why that TV show, the Marty Stewart show mm -hmm. and RFD came forth. But Kenny uh, has always been like, it's it, my, my, my partner and it's in that guitar world because it's interesting, you can take everybody, if you're recording off and just shove up our two faders. And we've never talked, well, usually we never, if we talk about something, it's about, you know, that line, but, but the parts do this is like a tapestry. Mm -hmm. He's he's really really a a deep well of knowledge in so many different ways. His tributaries run deep, and it's so fun to play with him. How did this uh, tour happen recently uh, with uh, Chris from um, the Birds? Roger and Chris. Mm -hmm. Well, Roger McGuinn came and did our TV show twice. And, you know, there's a Birds connection probably because of the Clarence White guitar that I play, mm -hmm. that old pull string. And Roger and I met years ago, and it was like instant. And I just love Roger. He's my brother. And, um, again, Birds World's kind of like um, Foggy Mountain World. You know, you know, once a bird. Mm -hmm. And I had never met Chris Hillman, really, formally. and shook hands a time or two. But Roger came and did our TV show, and... We got to be the birds, and we were one thing about that TV show. We worked hard on playing the record, mm -hmm. putting people back in the frame, that made them, you know, made us fall in love with them as an mm -hmm. audience. And I wanted to follow Roger, you know, home and, and just keep playing. And so we were in Austin, Texas, and my phone rang one day. Hey, man, it's Roger. And we were in the airport in Santa Domingo, or he and his wife uh, Camilla. And it's the 50th anniversary of the Sweetheart record. Would you guys be interested in going out and playing a few shows? I went, the answer is yes. I don't care what the deal is, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. And we, we would shed that record out on the road, and we got to be the birds, and that tour was magic. It was what music is really all about. I heard it was all, I missed it, oh, unfortunately. Oh, man, it was every night, you know. Some songs better than others on night A or night B, but in general, what I loved about it is is people that love going to concerts and grew up on those records and have held them in their hearts all these years, they got to come and see it because most of them thought that they would never see it mm -hmm. ever again. Right. And there's Hillman and there's McGuinn and there's Clarence's guitar and there's, you know, Scruggs playing steel when playing Lloyd Green's parts and Harry singing those harmonies that, you know, that Crosby and those guys used to do and me and Kenny would swap off doing whatever we needed to do. It was awesome. It was a, a tour of a lifetime. I think the, when the birds did um, Mr. Tambourine Man, it kind of would shifted the whole music industry, didn't it? I mean, that was kind of the, the first blending of folk and rock or something like Weren't that. Weren't they called the American Beatles? I yeah. Think, I think they were referred yeah. to as yes. that. Mm -hmm. When I first came to Nashville, 
I, I really was invited up here by Roland White, Clarence White's brother, who was in Lester Flatt's band. I'd met him on the Bluegrass Festival circuit when I was 12. He gave me his phone number, said, call me sometimes, you know, maybe you could come up and ride the bus with us for a weekend. And I got kicked out of school for reading a country music song roundup instead of studying in my history book. And I called Roland and I said, this would be a wonderful time to come see you. Labor Day weekend, 1972. And I came up here, and within the course of a week, Lester Flatt offered me a job. But I noticed, And I lived at Roland's house. My folks were still in Mississippi. But I noticed that Roland had a great record collection. But there were a stack of birds records, Kentucky Colonels and birds records. I said, what's the deal with the birds? He says, my brother Clarence plays with them. So I had that sound in my head. And after Roland left the band to go back and work, he and Clarence and their other brother Eric put a band together for a few months before Clarence got killed, um, I discovered a record called Sweetheart of the Rodeo. Mm -hmm. And I liked it because it was the first time that I heard folk and honky-tonk and rock and roll and hard country, bluegrass and gospel music collide mm -hmm. successfully. And not long after that, Lester Flatt played a show in Cincinnati. Dig this. It was Lester Flatt, Cool and the Gang, and Chikoria. <laughs> a college buyer showcase and we encored nine times I thought they'd laugh us off but we encored nine times and we became rock stars Lester Flatt and the Nashville Guests became rock stars we played hippie festivals uh, you know big old bluegrass festivals rock shows the most unlikely things but one of the first shows was Michigan State and it was Lester Flatt Graham Parsons Emmy Lou Harris and the Eagles when they was starting to tip off Del, uh, Desperado, I think. Mm -hmm. But that night, I saw the Sweetheart of the Rodeo record come to life. And I went, aha, this is how you do it. And I remember saying on the bus that night after the show, I said, this is the way to live a musical life. And the old guys just look at me and went, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I've held that in my heart, that, that one record made a profound influence on me. Yeah, I, me too. And... Uh Golly, the, you know, 12, I mean, you were almost an embryo on the road. I mean, how do you start out that young, man? I mean, how did you, how were you even legally able to do that, you know? Well, I was practicing my autograph in the third grade. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I, and in my hometown, <clears throat> Philadelphia, Mississippi, 380 miles south of here, uh, we had a great radio station. WHOC, still on the air, 1490 on your radio dial, 1,000 watts, pure pleasure. But they would come on the air in the mornings playing country music. Mm -hmm. Noon, there was like an hour of Southern gospel. The afternoon was rock and roll top 40. Soul, late afternoon, and then easy listening classical to sign off. I thought everybody's radio station did that. I was like a sponge, but it was country music that I loved the most. It got to my heart. The others got to my head and my feet. Country music got me in the heart. And in 1964, in my hometown, there were three civil rights workers murdered. And the world got ugly down there, really, really ugly. And um, everything about life changed. But on Saturday afternoons, me and my dad would sit close to each other on the couch and watch the Porter Wagner show and Flatten Scruggs and the Wilburn Brothers show and that good old Nashville music and mm -hmm. Dale Reeves Country Carnival. Johnny Cash show later. And I knew that that train that ran behind our house, I didn't want to go to New York or Hollywood. I wanted to go to Nashville and put on those kind of clothes and play Fender guitars and Martin guitars and get on a, a country music bus and do that. And I knew that that's the life that I wanted to live. Started my first band when I was nine. And I got here just as fast as I could. And I would have got here five years earlier had I could I. Have. How, how did you get started on, on playing? I mean, it was, it was, did, was somebody in your family play? Or? My mom played piano at church. Uh, my buddy Butch Hodgins down the street, his wife, or his mama, not his wife, his mama showed me three chords on the guitar, Tiger by the Tail, GCD. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, into the world of country music, that can get you. And that's how it started. And I just simply watched people on TV, listened to the radio, and I had one of those record players you could slow down to, to 16. Mm -hmm. 
and figure things out. But a Johnny Cash record and a Flatt & Scruggs record were the first two records that I had. And that became the only two jobs I ever had as a working musician. Mm -hmm. And that, what, what was interesting about our little neighborhood band um, is that the British invasion was really strong at that time. But we played Folsom Prison Blues and Wildwood Flower and Mama Tried and those kind of songs. I felt like it was my job to, to be a correspondent and represent country music mm -hmm. in my neighborhood. And there's nothing different today, it's what I still do. Mm -hmm. Well, hey, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back. The Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum has been celebrating the men and women who make the music of our lives since 2006. The Musicians Hall of Fame is the one and only museum in the world that honors the musicians that played on the greatest recordings of all time. It's a music city, huh? It's, uh, I mean, where else are you going to get the cats, all the cats that are in this room? From Hank to Hendrix, from L.A. to Nashville, the Musicians Hall of Fame will take you on a musical journey highlighting the talented musicians that created the soundtrack of our lives. Come see what you've heard. And while visiting, check out the interactive Grammy Museum Gallery at the Musicians Hall of Fame. Located in the heart of downtown Nashville in the first floor of the historic Nashville Municipal Auditorium. See you soon at the Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum. Welcome back to the Musicians Hall of Fame backstage with Marty Stewart. So, um, Johnny Cash, how did, how, did, how did that happen? How did I get the job with Johnny Cash? Mm -hmm. How did you meet him? How did you... Lester Flatt, I stayed with Lester and his band from 1972 to 79 when he passed away. And all of a sudden, I found myself needing a job. And uh, I looked around the world of bluegrass, and Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys were full. The Osborne Brothers were full. Jimmy Martin and the Sunny Mountain Boys were full. Uh, Ralph Stanley and the Clinch Mountain Boys uh, were full. So. I needed a gig. I actually talked to Lonnie Mack, went to upstate New York, talked to him, and that didn't quite feel right. Um, I was thinking about, actually in this very building, I uh, hung out with Bob Dylan one night, I was thinking of going to California, jumping on there. But in the meantime, I walked in and I played some with Dr. Merle Watson that summer and Vassar Clemens. And I needed a gig because that was just a summer stop. And um, I ran, walked into the Old Time Pickin' Parlor on 2nd Avenue. Randy Wood had a place. And there was a guitar uh, luthier named Danny Farrington building a black guitar that had a gold eagle down here. And it was really snazzy. And I went, who's that for? Is it Johnny Cash? I went, ah. So I said, do you mind if I go with you when you deliver it? I'd, I'd like to meet him. He's one of my old time heroes. He said, sure. So I kept up with the progress of the guitar. And the day came, and Danny called and said, I'm going to deliver it to Cowboy Jack's studio this afternoon. Meet me there. And so met Farrington there, and we walked into Cowboy's studio, knocked on the, the door of Cowboy's office, opened the door, and it was like you know, a Cheech and Chong movie. And the scene was Cowboy was dancing with a martini glass on his head. <laughs> <laughs> and this big smoke screen, and John R. Cash was sitting over there singing the Wabash Cannonball. <laughs> Hello, I'm in. Mm. And what I didn't know when that happened is two of my lifetime friends, you know, was in one room mm -hmm. waiting. And so I was introduced to the Cowboy, and I was introduced to John. And John stood up. He just he shook my hand. He just kept shaking my hand. He says. Where are you from, son? I went to Mississippi. He went, I thought so. He said, where you been? I said, getting ready. He said, I thought so. And we spent the afternoon together and wound up getting in Cowboy's car and going out on, to uh, Johnny Cash's farm or, or his uh, cabin that night, just looking around. And about a month later, I think it was, I got a call one day. I was in Cedar Rapids, Iowa finishing my last show with Doc Watson. Went back to the hotel after the first show. Red light on the phone was blinking. It was my mom. She said, Bob Wooten, Johnny Cash's band member, is looking for you. And I called him. He said, John wants to know if you want to go to work with us. I said, it's a good idea. I said, when are you thinking about it? He said, tomorrow. 
I said, keep talking. He, I said, he said, where are you? I went, Cedar Rapids. He said, I said, where are you? He said, we'll be in Des Moines. It was a two hour rental car ride and I walked in the hotel and Bob Wooten met me, shook my hand, and welcomed me. He said, we were leaving here in you know, an hour and a half or whatever. And he said, have you some lunch and we'll get your room ready and show up. So I walked into the cafe and the maitre d' came over after I'd sat down. He says, Mr. Cash is on the phone for you. I went, okay. So I went over and John says, hey, son, glad you're here. I went, glad to be here. He said, you got anything black to wear? I went, probably. And he said, do you know all my songs? I went, you still sing them in the same key? He said, probably. I said, then I'll probably know him. He says, well, I'm probably going to take a nap, and I'll probably see you later. Click. <laughs> <laughs> and so. And what year is this? 79. And I got on the, the was bus. Was Mar Marshall still? Marshall was not there. He had just left. He had just left. And um, it seemed like Joe Allen might have been playing bass at that time, I think. And, uh, or Henry Strelecki, I think, actually was playing oh, bass yeah? at the very beginning yeah. for a minute. And I was shown to my mark on the stage, and he walked out and went, hello, I'm Johnny Cash, and I heard Ring of Fire start. And again, I hung my head, and it took me back to being nine years old, watching him at the Coliseum in Jackson, Mississippi, going, this is what I want to do in my life. And that had to have been It leveled me. Right? Oh, man, it was like going from here to here in you know, one step. And Lester was a, you know, a beloved you know, national touring act. Um, but John was, you know, I remember one time we were going across the border in Budapest and the guards knew him and it was kind of fun, but they said, you can't cross until you sing us a song. And so John got his guitar out and sang a song going across the border in Budapest. And I thought, this guy's serious. I'm out on the world stage now. And it was from, you know, and then it became like, again, the Foggy Mountain Boys thing and you know, and Bird World, it's like the old line in the Eagle song, you can check out anytime you like, but you can never leave. I never left, you know, made records and and had some success, did a whole lot of things, but when he still, when the phone rang and he needed a guitar player, he was still the chief to the day he died. Mm -hmm. Did you stay in contact with him? We though? were next door neighbors. Out in Hendersonville, Roy Orbison, his house was here, our house was here, and then John and June lived there. And I saw him four days before he died. And you took the last picture, right? Yeah. Well. Wow. I miss him every day. I miss his twisted sense of humor more than anything. <laughs> he had a dark sense of humor. I loved it. I was lucky enough to hang out when Billy was producing an album on him in 84, I think it was, 83, 84. Is that the Baron? Yeah, he did that one. That was at Columbia, though. This one was um, over at 1111 Studio. Oh. And um, that's when he was doing the, that period of time when he was doing the uh, Ray Charles Friends album. Mm -hmm. But I just remember he walked in the room. Of course, I remember him. You know, when I think of him, I was turning into the alley behind Columbia one afternoon, a shank of the evening, and the sun was going down, and Johnny was he looked kind of haggard, you know what I mean, during that time. And he turned and he looked over his back, his shoulder at me, you know, and I just, I, that's just, if I had a camera, like, you know, that's, that's the picture I see in my mind all the time. But I don't care, well, you know, you felt his presence when he walked. I don't care, give me your best shot. Give me your best rock star, give me your best president, give me your best whatever you got. And then bring him in the room and see what happens. Well, when, I was going to say when he he sucked the air out of the room. Absolutely. I mean, when he walked in, you could you could you know you could feel it. You, know, you could tell it. It was weird, and he did cut one of my songs, but unfortunately, did he? Yeah, which one? It, well, it never made the friggin' album. I got a copy of it, but um, it was it was a kind of a novelty thing. It was mm -hmm. called uh, "I Know You Love Me," and uh, I wrote it from watching Pepe Le Pew mm -hmm. cartoons because they didn't really love him, you know. And um, he, and it was. I was going for the boy named Slew kind of thing, you know, just to, because he was funny. He could do anything. Yeah. But some, for whatever reason, it didn't make the album. But I got it. Talking about sucking the air out of the room and his dark sense of humor. I had breakfast with him one morning, and he could make you know whether it was peeling an apple or lighting a cigarette or you know whatever he did, he just 
just just by being him. It looked so cool. One morning, you know, he he lit a cigarette, and he was he and it went from here all the way down to the butt in one drag. <laughs> When he blew the smoke out, he said, I quit smoking three days ago. I went, you did? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Do you remember Larry Lee? Absolutely. Larry used to tell me, we'd sit in the lobby at CBS and he'd tell me stories with Johnny. And Did you know, do you remember the little, when he had the little monkey? Spider monkey? Yeah. Yeah. Larry told me that he gave him a pill and the monkey finally just... Probably so, you know, and that was in the early 60s when they were completely nuts. But uh, they had, John started a tax shelter record called Spider Monkey Records in honor of the, and I believe they recorded a song on Gordon Terry, who was a, a cool fiddle player and a guy that was working on the road with him. And Don Helms, Hank's old steel player, rewrote the Battle of New Orleans and it was, he called it the bottle of New Orleans. In 1950, where we took a little nip mm -hmm. along with Mr. Williams on the way to Mississippi, packed eight deep in a Packard limousine, uh, going to play for Oscar Davis in the town of New Orleans. It was the, one of the greatest parodies you've ever heard. So they did this on Gordon on the A side, on Spider Monkey Records, and they couldn't figure out what to do on the B side. So, so they just tuned for about two minutes and the song was called Tune It Up. <laughs> <laughs> Probably pretty good. Yeah, that's six. That's a humor again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, well, speaking of musicians, so what's what was there? Who did you did you have somebody that? You oh had? yeah. First and foremost, Luther Perkins. When I was plugging in my first Fender guitar and and learning my way, uh, looking my way across the the you know the landscape of country music bands, I couldn't tell you what Magellan did or what you know. Uh, a lot about American history at that point, but I could tell you what kind of costumes the bands wore, who played what brand guitar, what the drummer played, what their hair looked like, and just I knew everything about any country band, you know, that was going on in this town starting about 1967. And Luther Perkins was still, and to this day is still, I think, one of the most brilliant guitar players. You think you can do it, really? Mm -hmm. Pick it up and show me how to do it right. He, it can't. He, he was a one-in-a-lifetime guy. I love Roy Nichols playing Merle's uh, t player. The other ultimate musician in my life was Ralph Mooney on the steel guitar. And I loved Tommy Jackson and Vassar Clements fiddle playing when I was first starting. I knew who they were. I knew that Vassar played real lonesome, real bluesy, which suited my Mississippi soul. Uh, I loved the feel that Junior Husky played. It felt like a cushion coming out of that Studio B thing. Pig Robbins mm -hmm. was like one of my, and still to this day is, you know, one of my all-time musical heroes. Uh, then you got on the bluegrass guys, uh, you know, I knew all those bands. But what I loved the most about, and I heard Mooney say one time about, he said, yeah, he sang for me one time. <laughs> <laughs> he was the star, you know. <laughs> and. Uh, mm -hmm. But there was a lot of truth in that because those musicians, the A-team of Nashville and those Nashville musicians, part of their brilliance, in my mind, was they could take any singer and create a sonic identity around them. Mm -hmm. And beyond that is that every time Lloyd Green came on the radio, I knew, or on my record player, I knew it was Lloyd Green from his tone. Right. I knew it was Hal Rugg. I knew it was Weldon. Right. I knew it was Don Helms and on and on, and the same with guitar players. I knew Grady's playing. Mm -hmm. I knew that Pete Wade was close, but he, Grady had little nuances that were different. I knew the difference in Bob Moore and Junior Huskies playing, and I'm 12 years old talking this stuff, but I would studied that stuff. And um, that was one of the beauties of the Nashville Cat thing to me. I loved the California players, the Wrecking Crew. I'd listen to those records. But those Nashville cats, I wanted to be one of them. I wanted to be uh, in, in that circle. And to this day, they're still the cats. They're still the cats. And, um, but the thing that I love most about those guys is their tone and their looks were their autographs. Mm -hmm. It was just as identifiable to me as Merle Haggard singing or Tammy Wynette singing or George Jones is singing. Those guys behind them 
Charlie McCoy. You know, I, I never knew where he was going to turn up. Mm -hmm. And when I found out he was the guy that did the tuning on Detroit City while Jerry Reed sat there and did it, held the guitar in his lap, I went, that's awesome. That's, that is such a defining thing in my life. And the Nashville guys were just beyond compare in my mind. Yeah, Billy Sherrill said one time, he said, um, okay. he said, I never liked to stick my head in anybody else's sessions, you know, but one day I was at Columbia and I kind of happened to open the door and Charlie McCoy's in there playing his keys. <laughs> his, his car keys, you know, mm -hmm. on a song. You know, I mean, he could play anything, <laughs> literally. I liked it because it, it was it was a time capsule in the sense that those guys were mostly southern boys, mm -hmm. cool guys, world class country boys in some cases. Uh, but when you listen, come on, man, listen to some of those Tammy Wynette records. Or those early Charlie Pride records, that first stretch of Charlie Pride mm -hmm. records. Play me any records that are any better and more elegant than that. And Billy Sherrill, again, you know, as it comes to mind, is just one of those masters. Cowboy Jack Clement, that point in time, oh, you know, it just it captured my heart. And to this day, I still return to those records when I need, when I lose my way and want to get started again. They still take me right back. And what it really causes me to do is re-fall in love with music. Right. There is, you know, there is that sound in the Quonset Hut, that, that bass sound. And B. It's, B. Yeah. And it's, it's that big old cushion. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, Studio B, as you know. Now, we're it, talking RCA? RCA B. Okay. That's the first place I ever got to play in Nashville uh, with Lester Flat. But years went by, and it had kind of become, you know, a classroom, basically, right? A mm -hmm. tourist stop for the Hall of Fame. But I'd go in there, and I would go, boy, if the right band and the right song, and let's study this room out and figure out how to do it in here and take people who loved what came from here. So we did this record called The Superlatives called Ghost Train, the Studio B Sessions. And one mm -hmm. day I was in the middle of that room, and I thought, Connie's voice, Connie Smith's voice, in the middle of this. I gotta hear it, I gotta hear it. So we wrote this song called I Run To You. And Connie used to tell me that she loved that studio because she knew where to aim her voice to get it to come back. Mm -hmm. And when they built the big pig, she said, I couldn't do anything with that room. She said, I, I, I just couldn't. But Studio B was like home to her. And we gathered around Connie and we made a record. And it was like, it reminded me how precious that studio is. It's kind of like, Sun and you know, uh, Hitsville up north. It's you could never plan that. Mm -hmm. People b spend millions and millions and millions of dollars on studios, but you don't get that kind of sound. Well, I, you know, I was I just put up a Bob Moore interview I did in 2004, just last week, and he talks about when they went into the Quonset hut. Of course, the early stuff they did in the basement of the house. You know, mm -hmm. that was incredible. But when they built the Quonset hut, he said, my, he said, there's not a a, a square foot in that Quonset hut that, I, that when we were doing it, setting it up, and they used burlap. I mean, you know, that was the kind of high tech stuff in the ceilings to to catch the acoustics and everything. He said, but my base peg went on every square foot in there until we found the sweet spots, you know, and that's where they stayed, you know. And that is still relevant today. When I first started playing around Cowboy Jack Clements' uh, studio, the first thing he did is went to the he went like this went to the filing cabinet and had, handed me a list of cowboys rules. Never speak while the cowboy is speaking. <laughs> uh, uh, always be on time. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, never mention headphones or the like. Mm -hmm. Those kind of rules that cowboy had, but at the time it was absurd because everybody was living in headphones, and which we do, but. When you learn to play the room and bring it down where you can play live and hear the vocalist, it's called dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what I hear uh, on those old records. But it's still relevant today. We got to play in Way Too Loud. And I took the band to a church and we played where we had to pay attention. And then we started talking about dynamics, nuances, vocals, blend, all those things that come with, you know, starting a band, if it's a real band. And one night we had played the Grand Ole Opry and we played really loud and I heard it back and it sounded about that big on the speaker. 
But then Hank Snow and the Rainbow Ranch Boys played, and they you could basically talk like this while they were playing, and it sounded this big on the mm -hmm. speaker. I went, oh, got it. Way off course here. Let me go back. But we work really hard when we make records and that old TV show to put the mic in the right place, use the right mics, use instruments with real tone in them, and not just something somebody gives you, you know, put on to promote if it's not what you really love. But there's a strict set of standards that we really, and it's a lifetime, again, a life sentence, chasing tone. Mm -hmm. But when you find my advice to any young musician, when you find that guitar or mandolin or bass or banjo, whatever your instrument of choice is, when you find it and you know you got it, lock it in, stay with it. It worked for Willie Nelson, it worked for Bill Monroe, it worked for Maybell Carter, it worked for Earl Scruggs, it worked for Vassar Clements. Uh, you know, they, that's, again, back to that tone. That's their signature, and it becomes well, a life partner. You know, the it's it's so wild to think about. That, you know, they used to start out with one, two, three tracks from those greatest records, and and the way the engineer would mix the session was move them closer, or further away from the microphone. I mean, that's that was it. We did some sessions at uh, Capitol in Hollywood, and the great engineer Al Schmidt was right across the hall working on a Bob Dylan record, I think. And Al came over and listened to some things we were doing. And it was an instrumental record that we'd been working on. And he gave his thumbs up, and Mick Conley, our engineer, was like, that's Al, you know. But Al is another one of those guys. His version of EQ is move the mic and find it, like mm -hmm. Bob Moore's talking about. And there's a lot to that. There's a, it takes more time. You have to slow down. For about 20 years, we've missed on Harry Stinson's drum, sound, drum sounds, in my opinion. But we finally got it right because we slowed down and brought three sets of drums and let, let the song dictate what we need. You know, back to Connie, that voice, it's never wavered, it's never wavered. And when you have something like that, that you know that it's a sound that you can count on, you can work around that, you can build around it. It becomes architecture then, and I love that. Hey, we're gonna take one more break, we'll be right back. Can we sit down for a pizza? Yeah. <laughs> hey Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum Backstage fans, check out our new backstage gear. From t-shirts to coffee mugs, we've got you covered. Not yet a fan? Check out our YouTube channel and enjoy some intimate conversations with the world's best musicians. Welcome back to Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage with Marty Stewart. So Marty, uh, uh, we hadn't talked about the Ryman Auditorium. I mean, what's, what's that mean to you? So the Mother Church of Country Music kind of says it all. It was, it was, again, like country music was when I was a kid growing up, it was just part of the atmosphere of our house. It was um, the people that played there and the, and the building itself. I knew before you know I set foot in Nashville that's where Bill Monroe had put Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs and Chubby Wise and Howard Watts next to him, and they had formed what we now know as bluegrass music, defined it, you know. I knew that's where Johnny Cash drug his microphone stand across the footlights and got sent home politely. Um, I knew from sitting on my grandmother's knee at, in her kitchen down in Mississippi after Patsy Cline and Hawkshaw Hawkins and Randy Hughes and uh, Copa, Cowboy Copas had lost their life in a plane crash. They started the Opry broadcast that night with a moment of silence. I could hear people crying. Mm -hmm from 380 miles away and feel their, the weight of their tears. So it was huge to me in, in my mind, in my heart. It was just Yankee Stadium, you know, Yeah. whatever. It was the Coliseum, whatever. But when I came up here on Labor Day weekend in 72, Roland White was supposed to pick me up at the Greyhound Station, which was basically right across the street from the Ryman at that time. And at 2.30 in the morning, got off the bus with my suitcase and my mandolin, wearing my suit, you know, and no rolling. He had got involved in a jam session and lost track of time. I thought, well, maybe I'm at the wrong place. So I went around to the corner, and there was the Ryman. And it almost dropped me to my knees. It was tired, and it was weary, and windows were broken out, and the doors were funky. But it was beautiful to me. And I wanted to belong behind those doors so bad. And as time went on, um, 
I loved it every time. But as time, we played there with Lester. But as time went on, you know, they moved out to Opryland, and it just became, became this empty thing that people would pay, you know, two bucks to go in and sit and have their picture made. And I went in there one day just to sit in the, in, in the balcony and look around. And I remember a pigeon flew across. I thought, this is not good. Mm -hmm. And they were going to tear it down. And Bud Wendell was uh, the CEO at Gaylord at the time. And I remember going to Bud and said, Bud, we can't let this happen. And Emmy Lou got on board. And one after another, people started talking. And the old timers didn't care. Roy Acuff thought it should have been burned to the ground, you know, 40 years before that. He didn't like it because it'd freeze you to death in the winter, burn you up in the summertime, but I saw beauty in it. And I got to cut the ribbon along with Porter and a couple of other people on opening day and got to be a part of the first concert there. It's home to me. Mm -hmm. It's if I have a home show place, it's the Ryman. We did an interview with Emmy about a month ago and we were talking about that and, and I just, you know, I knew that she was a big part of, of helping to save it. And I just, you know, you, to me, I can't even imagine Nashville without it for some, I mean, it's, it'd be like tearing down the Capitol building or something, know. you know. And Might not have happened if Bud Wendell had not been the guy. Because Bud understood hillbillies and he understood, you know, what we, who we were, what we were as a collective group of people. But he also understood, you, you know, corporate life. And he was the magic guy to get it done. Yeah, in Europe, they, they understand how to preserve mm -hmm. beautiful old buildings that define their culture and, you know, speak to architecture and the beauty of art. Here we knock it down and put a glass box up in its place. And, you know, we're talking about it today out on uh, North Nashville. There was a gorgeous little Gothic church that is now a Hardee's. It's like, how can you let that happen? Mm -hmm. but, but it happens. It happens. But isn't it, isn't it wild that now that is such a revered concert hall to every genre of music just about? I mean, Well, it did before, way before it was just a country music show house, remember? Vaudeville played there, you know, Hollywood's Finest played there, uh, the greatest speakers played there, opera singers, you know, played there. Uh, we just found a home of country music there, but I love the fact now that everybody comes here, and I don't care who you are, mm -hmm. I don't care who you are how many tickets you sell, how many records you've sold. When you step on the stage there, it knows, again, more about you than, than you know about it. She's seen it all, that building. And I think everybody does a better show because it's at the Ryman. Yeah. How did um, the Ken Burns thing, uh, how did that happen? And how do you, did, have you seen it have an impact on, on Nashville since it's been out? On the Ken Burns show on country music? Mm -hmm. Connie's son, Kerry Watkins, came, was, was teaching English in Taiwan. And he would come home for Christmas for a Christmas visit. And this goes back maybe 10 years now. As he was leaving the house to go back to the airport one day, he said, I saw Ken Burns on TV last night. And he said, he might be thinking about a show about country music. I went, ha ha. And uh, I love Ken Burns' work, so I wrote him a fan letter. I heard you might be doing, if you need me, the answer is yes. And, you know, I'm the deep end of the pool concerning some things about country. Call me if you need me. And a couple of months later, I got a reply from uh, Dayton Duncan, his producer. And the next thing I know, Ken Burns is at, uh, I mean, Dayton came to the office. And a month or two after that, Dayton and Ken Burns came to the house. And the superlatives were there. Connie was there. Uh, Gary Carter, Connie Steele player. And we played country music in the living room. And the next day we went to work. And it was about an eight-year job to get that done. But I knew that I wanted to be a part of that. And I knew that country music needed it. Because everything Ken does is evergreen. It becomes a part of the American curriculum. Mm -hmm. And I knew that all of a sudden country music would be elevated into the alongside the national parks and prohibition and jazz and baseball and the mm -hmm. Roosevelt's and on and on, Civil War. And he brings a completely different audience to the game. And it was a labor of love. And do I think it affected country music? Absolutely. Part of the teardown of COVID is I never went anywhere. Went, you know, there was like, I saw you on the Ken Burns thing. It was, it, 
the show was awesome. Mm -hmm. Just couldn't say enough good things about Ken Burns. And then, of course, COVID shut that down. But the good news about that is, is his work never goes away. Mm -hmm. And it will live on and oh, on. I watched and on. it the other night again. Yeah, <laughs> man, it's and it's it's solid. It's mm -hmm. you know. I didn't know that you had anything like that. I mean, I, I obviously knew that you were on the show, but I didn't know that you were so involved in it. Oh, uh, yeah, and it, the first thing I think I remember doing it when Dayton came to the office, I said, "Let me give you a list of people that you need to talk to yesterday." Right. Now, don't don't ask questions. Just go do your research and go. And Dayton followed suit on that, and they got serious about it. It's awesome to watch that team work. They send a, a team of scanners in, research, uh, you know, and everything about that team is just so pro. And it's all done in a little white house up in Walpole, Connecticut. And uh, the cultural center that I'm working on down in Mississippi, the other day a truck pulls up, gift from Florentine Films. Yeah, what is it? All of the research materials that they did to produce that show they donated to our wow, library down there. That's great. That's wonderful. Well, um, you know, obviously, you know that museums mean a lot to me, music museums especially. You've got more stuff. That, are you going to open a museum yourself? Well, we're working on a cultural center in Philadelphia, Mississippi called Congress of Country Music. And the way the state, you know, when you drive across the state line in Mississippi, it says, Welcome to Mississippi, birthplace of America's music, and can back it up. You know, do your research. You can back it up. It's amazing what did and continues to come from Mississippi. Mm -hmm. So the way the state lays out up in the uh, northeast corner is Tupelo, which is the spiritual home of rock and roll. It's Elvis's birthplace. Across the Delta in uh, Indianola is B.B. King's Blues Museum and Cultural Center. The Grammys put in a beautiful, incredible facility on the campus of Delta State. Mm -hmm. And in the east central part of Mississippi, where I'm from, Philadelphia is 35 miles from Meridian, which is Jimmy Rogers' hometown. And it'll be the spiritual home of country music in the state, Marty Stewart's Congress of Country Music. So all of that, those archives and treasures will be on display, but it's an educational facility. Uh, the Ellis Theater is about to go under renovation as we speak. So again, life sentence, right? <laughs> That's right, man. <laughs> I feel your pain. Again, but it's our you. legacy. It's yeah. what we leave behind, you know. It is for and kids to study on. Yeah, and to inspire. Yeah, I I started just in the nick of time, and to catch the last surviving Funk Brothers and Wrecking Crew guys, and and uh, for the most part, and and got them on film, but got the actual instruments that were used, you know, on so the instruments so, on the on those records. So. If I'd waited another, uh, and I didn't know. I mean, I just, I just got to the end of writing songs and selling guitars. And I was like 48, 49. I'm like, well, what am I going to do? You know. And well, that's why we did the TV show again. With the, we saw that our, that era slipping over the edge. Right. And you had, as you say, you you had two minutes to get it, and you got it. Mm -hmm. And thank you for doing it. And thank you, too. And My pleasure. Thank you for doing this show. Anytime. Been friends a long time. And you bet. You know, I've, uh, I'm going to show some pictures on here of when I opened up my West End guitar shop. You, you showed up, thankfully, and uh, I've got you and Dwayne Eddy and James Burton, Jerry Lee's guitar player. Kenny Lovelace. Kenny Lovelace. Yeah. Brooks and Dunn, yep. and I appreciate that too. Well, Clint, talking Clint about White. those musicians that are here, James, good Lord, come mm -hmm. on, and Gene Moles out in California, and Kenny Lovelace is one of my favorite musicians. And, and one of the nicest people in, in the world. world. And been with Jerry Lee since 1967. And he, got, he shot him, didn't he? No, not him. Oh, he's, uh, but, oh, I thought he got shot. <laughs> no, not him, that was the bass player. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but come on, man. Jerry Lee hadn't been with Jerry Lee since 1967. Really? But Kenny yeah. stuck it out. Yeah, he left a long time ago. <laughs> He's a wonderful guy. Yeah. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank you. And Love thank you all place. for watching Musicians Hall of Fame.